Our today's guest is David Christensen, the executive director of the Haskell Foundation and a contributor to a number of dependently typed languages, a dependent type advocate and evangelist who through his work, talks and texts has managed to introduce many people to the topic. Today, we're going to talk about dependent types and how you can work with them today. So um, I hope that the introduction covers everything you would like to cover. If there's anything you would like to add, please go ahead. I'd say that I have one small point of disagreement, which is that I, I'm not necessarily an evangelist for dependent types. I think that they're an interesting idea and an important idea and one that's great to learn about, but I don't think that they're right for most people to use for most projects, at least not yet. Um, that said, you know, progress is being made and maybe that'll be different in, in a few years. Well, let's, let's first talk about what they are. Um, sure. and then we can maybe come back to that point and, and see, um, in, in a little yeah. bit with a little bit more rigor, um, uh, to, to, to understand our, that, that opinion in a, in a little bit more rigorous way. So how would you define dependent types actually? Yeah. So dependent types are types that can depend on values is the usual way that it's talked about. So a way to think about it is that in uh, languages like Haskell and Java, you can have a type which takes another type as an argument. So you might have a type called list, but list isn't really a type until you tell it what the type of the things in the list are. So you could say list of int or list of string or list of list of list of list of int. And this process of applying the type to another type gives you a type. So people will often um, talk about the, 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 the argument type being like a parameter to the type. Um, and in a dependently type language, you can have parameters that are not types themselves. So you could say, I have a list of five ints, or I have a list of 20 ints, or I have a list of zero ints. Uh, and you could say that uh, the type of appending of the operator that appends two lists isn't list of A to list of A to list of A, but it's instead list of N A's to list of K A's to list of N plus K A's. And that that's valid for any natural numbers or any lengths N and K. Um, and dependent types are interesting from a number of perspectives, I think. One of them is that they allow us to write very precise types down. Another is that they allow us to write very flexible types down. So you could say that, you know, depending on the value of this Boolean that the user generates as input to the program, the answer is going to be either an int or a string. You know, the, the caller picks which thing I return. Um, and that, that particular case isn't the most useful thing, but you can build very useful things on top of that. Um, you know, so you could, for example, have a representation of a database schema as a data type. And from the representation of the schema, you could derive a type which represents the result of a query against that schema. And then arrange your database library to take care of all this stuff. Um, and aside from being sort of both more precise and more flexible than non-dependent types, Dependent types are also interesting because, you know, depending on the specifics of the system you're building them in, they allow your type system to be used as a fully fledged logic for proving things about your program. So on the one hand, you know, we like to have precise types that encode various invariants about our data. But on the other hand, sometimes we also just want to sit down and crank out a mathematical proof that says um, that, you know, a program lives up to its specification, whatever that might be. Um, and some people are also wanting to use the logic of the type theory just to do ordinary mathematics and not even sort of program verification tasks. I'm a absolute garbage mathematician, so I don't use them in that way. So I have very little to say about that, but it does exist. Right. Um... You provided in, in your elaboration of what uh, dependent types are, the iconic, I think, example of uh, list equipped or indexed by length. Yeah. Um, is it your favorite 
uh, way to, to like show off uh, dependent types to like beginners? Or is there yeah. something something you would show to, because you know, your other example with database schemas, it's uh, very hard, like difficult for a person to envision right. if they don't have a background in Absolutely. encoding something like this. Uh, yeah. Do you have something like in, in the middle uh, that you, <laughs> yes. you know, uh, reach yeah. for to 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 explain yeah. something like mm -hmm. yeah so 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 first the a little bit of defense of the of the length index list I went through a period of time where I would play length indexed list bingo in a talk you know and like mark off on my card whenever someone got to that example because everyone uses that example and it's kind of not the most interesting example in the world so I absolutely get the 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 frustration with it but on the other hand it's it's a classic example because it has like a little bit of every kind of complexity you get with a data type. So it actually, you know, it's got um, one of one of its arguments, the type of the elements of the list is the same, no matter how long the list is, another one changes, which is the number. Um, so it's got, you know, a parameter and an index, as they say in the business. It has um, the ability to drive some interesting, like programmer user interface automation stuff without, you know, it's simple. So it, it's actually a very good example in a lot of ways. But from a practical perspective, yeah, I get it. Um, the, the, the second example I'd like to use is this example of having one data type that represents the types of some little language that you're implementing. So maybe it's got, uh, so we got like our data is, our data type, let's call it T. It'll have one constructor called nat, which represents you know, the natural numbers type. It'll have another constructor called bool, which represents booleans in our language that we're implementing, and then it might have a, a type const uh, or it might have a, a data constructor called arrow, which represents the function type. Then we can define a type of expressions, which are parameterized over a list of these types, which gives you the typing context and the type that the expression actually has such that you cannot write down an expression that has the wrong type and you cannot write down a variable that isn't in scope. Um, and this is certainly an example that's only compelling for people who think that Lambda Calculus is the, the easy thing they understand that they want to use to understand the new system. You know, if you're, if you're still learning Lambda Calculus, this is not a good example. So it's certainly going to depend on the audience. But for people who know that, you can then proceed to define a type of values, which are also indexed by the type. And then you can write a little interpreter. And it turns out that you can write a function from the type, uh, from the representation of the type of, of your sort of object language types, you know, like the bool, the nat, and the arrow. You can write a function from that to the actual types of your dependently typed programming language. So you can have a function that sort of case splits on that data type. And for the bool constructor, it returns the actual type of booleans. For the nat constructor, it returns the actual type of natural numbers. And for the arrow constructor, it returns an actual function type whose uh, argument and return types are found by, recur by recursion. And then you can just, in you can write a function which says, you know, given a list, uh, given a suitable environment, a uh, suitable runtime environment, so I can look up my variables, um, I'm going to produce something with the right type. And it's just a really cool example showing how you can because on the one hand, you've implemented a programming language, but on the other hand, you've also carved out some selection of the surrounding language that you're working in. And that's a really powerful tool to use for writing dependently type programs. So, Yeah, that's that's really cool. I think it's a really funny Yeah, example. it is. And and it's also, uh, we have so much, um, so many blog posts already about like, you know, writing embedded DSLs in Haskell, for example. Yeah. That is very, yeah. I think it's very relatable to... Well, and I mean, I mean it, mm. the, these blog posts are out there for a reason, right? We, we write a lot of yeah. embedded DSLs, and it's very nice to to have this sort of like advanced facilities while while we encode stuff like this. Um, yeah. So um, um, you already mentioned that that you aren't uh, you aren't evangelist, or you you don't think that hundred percent of programs should be written in like dependent in that way. Um, uh, but I'll ask I'll ask this question anyway because I have I have a very it's a it's a very interesting question for me personally, as um, uh, like Winsor Oakle and a lot of 
people in the FP industry are looking into um, perhaps in industrializing dependently typed systems. So we know really well, we as a society, how to sell well-typed systems to, to business, to the to businesses, right? To our customers. Um, so here you're thinking speedy refactoring and, um, you know, certain kinds of tests you don't have to write anymore. Yeah, yeah. Stuff, this kind like of stuff. This. yeah stuff like yeah. this. Um, and, and, you know, our sales can have like a very nice, like, you know, uh, bingo card that can like re reverse engineer into, into a sales pitch. Uh, yeah. do, do you think there's a similar methodology for dependently typed systems? And can there even be one, uh, given, as you mentioned, how like different dependently time systems have different perhaps implementation trade-offs and stuff like this? What, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah. So, I mean, different programming languages always have different trade-offs, right? I mean, Haskell and OCaml have pretty different implementation trade-offs. And there's certainly things where I'd rather use OCaml and things where I'd rather use Haskell and things where I'd rather use neither of them because a garbage collector would get in the way. And then I might look at Rust or C or something like that. Um, you know, it's, there's, there's no one programming language that is going to solve every problem in the best way. And this is probably going to reflect my complete lack of experience in sales. But if I'm going to try to sell something to someone, first, I want to understand what their needs actually are and find a way to actually meet them. So, um, one, one context where I've used, uh, some dependently typed, like features of Haskell in at work. There we had a large verification system and we really wanted to avoid a lot of certain kinds of bugs. And so there maintaining invariance through our data types was a pretty good argument. Um, in other contexts, I think that the ability to do more interesting things with, DS with embedded DSLs could be a good way to sell something if that was relevant for the person. Um, I think that being able to model aspects of a program that you can't model without, that you can't at least conveniently model without dependent types could be an interesting thing. But it's, for me, it would really depend entirely on who I'm talking to and what their problems are and seeing whether the dependent types actually do solve their problems. and. You know, I, I don't want to. I don't want to like talk down the thing that I love because it is a thing that I love. But I, I also think it's important to not try to, like, just just because I, I've I've got this screwdriver that I'm a big fan of. You know, I don't want to use it to like start pounding in nails. Like, it's 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 not right for everything, and it's gonna get right for more things as we learn more as a as a community, as you know, researchers make more cool stuff, as implementations get better, as we get more resources invested in high quality implementations and high quality instructional materials and training. You know, today, the big thing I would worry about is where do you find people who can maintain this? And that's, a, that's a real thing to worry about because like, it's certainly much more common for people to have an idea of what dependent types are than they used to, or to have maybe done some dabbling with Agda or, um, you know, like a, an undergraduate verification course that used software foundations. Like th these things exist a lot more than they used to, but it's still a pretty niche skill. So, um, you know, just, just because a thing isn't super useful for all industrial problems yet doesn't mean it'll never be. It doesn't mean it doesn't have value. It doesn't mean it isn't wonderful and beautiful and fantastic. But just because something is wonderful, beautiful and fantastic doesn't mean that we should necessarily inflict that on everyone around us at all times. My my huge hypothesis is that um, whoever w so you you mentioned database schemas. Yeah. Um, what you how the way you were describing this stuff made me think about uh, Haskell's library called Servant and the family mm -hmm. of uh, it, and it even does a little bit of dependently typed ish mm -hmm. ask things right with like type level strings and stuff. Yeah. Um, and generating like implementations for for APIs automatically and and whatnot. Um, so yeah, I mean, if if I would have to, so so not, from talking to you, I, I would I would say that uh, maybe you know 
writing servant, uh, reporting servant mm. to some dependently typed um, system and then kind of selling it for whatever, high assurance web servers, right? Because yeah. we sometimes really need to respond to some requests. Like for example, if we're you know, taking some, um, um, providing some emergency API for, for, for physical mm -hmm. emergencies or st and stuff like this, or, or maybe our nuclear uh, power plant, uh, uh, our, yeah. our sensors are going off and we really want to uh, make sure that like a particular sure. type of sensor would, would trigger a particular type of response um, um yeah so s stuff like this so i think i think that like whoever will implement yeah. like servant in lean uh will will at least uh be at yeah. the head of like uh hundreds of thousands so. of dollars worth uh project i think yeah so so i haven't ever used servant like my my industrial haskell experience has mostly been on either things that talk to text editors over a local socket or command line batch mode stuff. And so I've read about Servant, but I but I don't have concrete experience. But my based on everything I say, like it is basically using dependent types. I mean, like the the based on the definition I gave earlier, which which is what people would usually say, like full spectrum dependent types, you know, types are first class things, you can return them from functions, you know, they can they can be passed to functions. They can be computed with. Like we have a lot of that in Haskell, and we get more and more. Like like as soon as we got gadgets, you know, uh, generalized algebraic data types. So for those who may not know what that is, it's where you have a data type in Haskell that takes a type argument, and then the choice of constructor can cause that type argument to have a certain value. Right, so you um, and as soon as you do that, you have a runtime value, which is that data constructor, which is determining a type. So that is one form of dependent types. You know, it's 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 not some in in my opinion, it's depending on exactly why you want to say whether a thing has dependent types or not. Like maybe you know maybe you want to do some mathematics and then you need a specific thing and and that's great. You know, be specific with your definitions, but. When it comes to the kind of things you can achieve with it, like, you know, Haskell for a decade now has been able to do a lot of what you can do with many dependently typed systems. And and I've used those things and had gotten a lot of value out of them for the kinds of things you're talking about. So it's it's less of an either or, in my opinion. Right. Yeah, that's for most contexts. Yeah, that's a, that's a very constructive, um, constructive, constructive way to put it. Um, yeah. But for me, when when for example I read like servant code or or I I even mm. read the code that uh, uses um, kind of types oh, sorry values in the type level like lifted values, yeah. I feel like just ergo ergonomics of it is just kind of it feels a little right. bit like writing I don't know C plus plus boost libraries yeah. where you have yeah. you. By the That's by the way, in Boost you also have right like you can parameterize stuff like with five and <laughs> stuff, and you also sure, kind of sure. have dependent type facilities there. So it it kind of feels a little bit like C plus plus Boost libraries, uh, which is great, right? But I mean, um, mm. so so um, yeah, and and actually, I, I I agree. So in my experience, when when writing Haskell in that style, which which I did some back when I worked at Galois, uh, I would essentially write a write some code like in Idris in my head and kind of feel like I was hand compiling it. Kind of like people used to write C code in their head and like hand compile it to assembly code when they were doing assembly. It was very much that kind of a feeling. Like I think that uh, it's certainly easier to use than it used to be. And it, we have better features for it now than we did in the past, but it's, you can definitely tell that Haskell as a language wasn't designed for that style of programming to start with. And that it was, added on later in a way to be backwards compatible. I think they've done a great job under those constraints, but um, you know, when you design something to, to do something from the start, then you can certainly make it more convenient than when it's added, you know, uh, when, when the language is old enough to vote. Right. Uh, in, in almost all the, in, I think in all the countries, right? Well, um, yeah, yeah. I had to think for a yeah, second yeah. there. I'm like, okay, so, you know, 1990 to the 2000, you know to 2010 ish like that that'll... yeah yeah that's 
also crazy how 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 time flies well um yeah but i mean in 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 the community i have a feeling i yeah sadly i i don't program a lot these days and mm. uh, whenever i have to participate in somewhat technical discussion i feel like i'm failing at my job but i had to sometimes jump kind of on the semi-technical discussions about ergonomics of dependent types and yeah. in Sirocco, and i'm 99 percent sure that the, i can safely assume that for twig as well uh, we are very on the boat of ergonomic dependent types in haskell yeah. whereas uh right. there is i feel uh, still a sentiment in the community that says types should be types values should be values you can have your little operators to like lift one to to the other if you really if it pleases mm -hmm. you uh, but uh, we shouldn't kind of um junk junk kind of put it all in one blob um and there are a lot of arguments um one of the most um, popular one is that, well, okay, you you now you lift your uh, values to your type level, and now now you write, are writing like type level bugs instead of like runtime bugs. Like if you're if you kind of don't get the model right, then you won't get it right no matter which tools you use. And um, there's also some pedagogical. Um, remarks that oh it's going to be harder to teach or something like that so what's mm -hmm. how do you feel about this stuff where do you stand if it's if it's okay to ask a person in your position uh, that sort of question yeah yeah i mean i'm going to give you my honest answer but you probably won't be satisfied which is that i don't think that with any programming language related question that there's ever uh that the, 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 that you ever get a useful answer from saying like what should be done I think you get useful answers by saying what should be done by these people in this situation with these resources and this background and these goals and these constraints. And I I think that there is absolutely a real risk that if the, the, the Haskell culture, Haskell culture in particular, could evolve to be something that only experts can get involved in and only people with sort of deep experience and deep background. And, and then we'll, but one thing about only letting in experts is that you stop making new experts. And then, so that, that would be a real problem for the community if we sort of essentially isolate us from the rest of programming and never let anyone new in because we, you know, pull up the rope ladder behind us when we climb up to our, to our type castle. Um, so I, I do think it's very important that whatever we're doing, we maintain a way in for, for other people. And that we don't make it impossible to do something that Haskell has been very good at for decades now, which is, you know, Hindley Milner plus uh, higher kinded types plus uh, type classes. Like that that that's really a nice way to program and it's really effective. And I don't I, I think it's important that we don't break that because certain programs and certain contexts aren't gonna gain anything from fancier types. And they're so, so if we make everybody pay for it, but only a few people get to use it, that might be a problem, depending on what they have to pay. You know, if what they pay is, um, you know, maybe their their compiler is a five megabyte bigger download than it otherwise would be, probably that's fine. You know, if what they pay is their compiler takes an hour instead of ten minutes to to build their code base, and um, and it's got a whole bunch of obscure bugs that it wouldn't have had because it got more complicated, then that 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 might be an issue. So. I think it's important that we listen to a variety of people and take their perspectives and experiences seriously. Right. Um, and, and, and and part of that variety are the people who want to do the fancy types. Like, I want to do fancy types a lot of the time, but I, I also think it's important to not have to do them all the time. Right. Um, well, I, I don't want to <laughs> to turn this into into a, a debate panel, uh, but I, just, I, I would yeah, just yeah. like to mention a couple of things. Uh, I yeah. heard this argument about uh, increasing the amount of bugs in the compiler and i agreed yeah. with it to a degree but also uh while uh working on all the levels of the compiler uh both uh, yeah. we and sirocco and people in twig found a lot of bugs and fixed them right so we're kind of yeah, um, absolutely um 
so so there there might be that sweet spot of uh, of uh, when when we still didn't you know uh, introduce new bugs but already fixed the old ones because we're we're going really deep into the code base and another yeah. thing is that uh there was w d during the mass exodus of simons right uh, or at least at least one simon i mean the, there there were two simons and now there is one simon working regularly on GH. yeah yeah um so so and and, and simon marlow is still around and still doing cool stuff but, uh but Less but less GHT, yeah. So, so there was a real fear, I think, that that uh, um, we will run out of people who who understand GHT on all the levels. So, in a way, and in, in a way, yeah. doing huge things like uh, linear types or like uh, dependent types, uh, also, you know, edu kind of creates new compiler sure. uh, engineers for Haskell to, to maintain it further on and. Um, Finally, I want to say one thing. Um, as a beginner, um, when I was a beginner in Haskell, I um, I don't remember which particular extension uh, it was. It, it it had to do something with with higher kind of stuff. Um, and I was I was listening to uh, to Simon Peyton Johnson's talk, um, and he said something like, "Oh, we are introducing this stuff gradually, kind of for pedagogical reasons." to not confuse beginners. But I was extremely confused with lack of um, thoroughness and the abstraction that's provided to me, right? It was Absolutely. like, I like many people come to Haskell with at least some background in, in discrete mathematics. I mean, I know that it's a m m like myth, but like uh, at least there is some amateur understanding of, I don't know, like group theory, like uh, abstract algebra and stuff like this. And for me, it just, felt weird to, to, to have like partially implemented abstractions. Um, so there's this thing to consider as well, but yeah, let's, let, let's not go too, too deep into this. Yeah. Um, so, um, um, yeah, I guess we can, we can wrap up the, um, the Haskell questions with, with, with asking the, the following. So you mentioned that, so sure. what do, do you feel like, we will navigate this uh, initiative and the Haskell will become a proper vessel for, for dependent types. Isn't it already? Oh, okay. That's, that's a very nice answer. Um, so, I mean, I can, I can, I can elaborate on that a little bit. Um, I think that the design space for dependently typed languages is absolutely gigantic. Um, you know, it, it, if you look at if you look at sort of languages in the broad ML family, like you know, Haskell was until recently. <laughs> I guess it still is, depending on which flags you turn on, right? But like, take Haskell twenty ten, clearly in the ML family. Um, Standard ML clearly in the ML family. OCaml clearly in the ML family. They all make different design decisions on a different uh, in various ways, right? Like. You know, Haskell has type classes and polymorphic recursion. Standard ML has equality types and it has, you know, a generative functors. Um, you know, uh, OCaml has all the features, you know, but applicative functors by default. And here, applicative functors doesn't mean what it means in Haskell. Like, um, you know, like, but it has to do with like the way the module system works, right? You know, ha um, whereas Haskell almost doesn't have a module system to speak of. You know, it's it's got files with code and you can hide some names, but nothing along the lines of what you see in standard ML and OCaml. Um, uh, you know, I, I mean, like backpack is, is a thing, but it's not commonly used the way that, that modules are in ML. And and just in, in this area, there's you get really different practical trade-offs with respect to all these different features, and they all work differently. And, and, and they're all interesting points in the design space. But once you get dependent types in a language, then your design space just absolutely explodes. So some examples of decisions you can make that are in the sort of well-explored areas of dependently typed languages. One of, like, remember I was talking earlier about uh, appending to length indexed lists, and we've got the and we've got the return of that saying uh, n plus k being the length. Well, what if I'd written k plus n there? Like, should it be a type error or should it not be a type error? And and that right there exposes a huge gap in like 
how do we interpret the meaning of plus? Like, are we going to define it as a recursive function that's working on some partially symbolic values? Or are we going to be appealing to an SMT solver? Are we going to be doing like proof search across the thing, the properties that somebody has proved about equality? Like all three of those exist in languages um, and they all give very, very different user experience trade-offs. And that's just for that one little aspect. Another thing is, let's say we write some proofs, or let's say we have a data type which includes a few proofs that it's well-formed. Like maybe you've got a list which contains a proof on every con cell which says that the thing you're adding to the list doesn't already exist in it. How do I, What does it mean to compare two of those lists for equality? Well, that means like we have to compare the proof objects for equality. And different design decisions about the way that proof objects are represented can make that easy or difficult, um, interesting or boring. Um, you know, we, and it just goes on and on and on. And, you know, some interesting work going on there, like, like we have sort of the big dependency type languages like uh, Coq and Agda and Idris and Lean, and they're all fairly similar. Like they, they make quite a few different decisions in those areas. But, but then if you go and you take a look at something like Sedil that Aaron Stump's group is working on at the University of Iowa, or you look at uh, Zombie Trellis that Stephanie Weirich and, uh, and her students, uh, Wilhelm and Chris, were working on before they graduated. Like, they have very, very different answers to these kinds of questions. And all of them are super interesting. And as Haskell is growing dependent types, it's growing them in a very different way from something like Agda or Idris. And that means that these trade-offs are going to be very, very different. So, for example, people look and they say, oh, well, the type of type is type in Haskell. Like, that's a logical problem. But but actually, it's not because it, what it means is that you have to be strict in your proof objects. We have to be that anyway because that's how Gadgets work. Um, and doing that allows the a lot of other things in the language to be significantly simpler. And so Haskell plus dependent types is just, it's, it's never going to be Agda, and that's okay. It's going to be its own thing, and it's going to have different trade-offs than those, and we're all getting richer for it. So that, that's me with my researcher hat on. Then me with my, like, I like to program and get things done hat on. Um, Haskell is the only sort of reasonably dependently typed language that has the kind of library ecosystem that means you can actually get stuff done. You know, it's, it's got uh, a, an advanced mature compiler to a much greater extent than others, which are sort of less in that state. Like, so, so there's, there's a lot to recommend it already today. Um, do I wish that the user interface for doing dependently type things was easier? Absolutely, but but I but to claim that Haskell is not a good spot for dependent types today, I think, is taking a bit too myopic a view of what dependent types are and can be, and the kinds of things that they're good for and not good for, and where we get the values. That's so that was the short answer and the long answer. <laughs> that's 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 both both answers are very good. Um, both answers are, are um, were, were very good and um, yeah, I mean, um, I'm I'm a simple person. I just wanted to write less uh, colon colon proxy and if it's uh, if yes, if someone will, will be... yes, I I fully agree. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you for visible type applications. Um, so let's wrap up the whole. Pe- pedagogical stuff with me asking you about uh you you were very humble to say well you're you know proponent but not evangelist but i mean you wrote uh, the little typer book right or co-authored right so yeah me and dan friedman and um it's as far as i understand it's an an homage to the little humor right um i'd say that it's a sequel rather than homage like um, I mean, so so like the, so the the little schemer is based on the little lisper, which Dan wrote way back when, and then in in later editions, his student Matthias got involved, and so the I, I I forget which edition that was in, yeah, but so but but certainly by the time the little lisper becomes a little schemer, Matthias was involved as well. Um, but you know, Dan has been involved in a number of sequels, like the seasoned schemer, which is talking about control operators and continuations and all sorts of cool stuff like that. You know, the reason schemer where there's a this logic language mini canron that that he built together with Oleg Kisilyov and uh, Will Bird and 
and the latest in the second edition that just came out uh, his other student was also involved there um, and you know there's the little prover which is an ACL2 style system so, so essentially Dan's got this thing going where he gets interested in something and then he wants to understand it deeply so he finds somebody who knows about it and then they and then works together with them to create a, a little book and, and so these little books they're all written in dialogue form they all make a point of not using complicated mathematical examples um, ideally the examples are all food because everyone can relate to food um, you know they try to cook things down to their simplest essence they try to be short although we failed at that with the little typer it ended up longer than we wished it hopefully was hopefully not five megabytes but, longer um... <laughs> It's uh, it ended up being like I think four hundred and twenty ish pages. I don't know the exact number, but over four hundred pages. You know, we were I, I was kind of hoping we'd write around two hundred and fifty pages, but but I you know I had an idea of what what does basic competence with like the core type theory of of one of these classical dependent like languages entail. I think it means that you can prove that equality of natural numbers is decidable, and. That, that's how long it took us to get there without skipping steps and leaving people behind. So that's what we did. Uh, but yeah, so so the so little typer, the idea is really to help people who don't have a deep background in formal mathematical logic to get a sort of intuitive understanding of the core th theories that are used in languages like Koch and Agda and Lean and Idris. And 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 so that, such that you could go on and maybe have an easier time learning the the full on version with all the Greek letters and and also, you know, get an appreciation of what's going on behind the scenes in those languages. So we, we don't really teach you how to do anything practical with dependent types in that book. We try to we try to help you get a, a feeling in your gut for how they work such that you can then maybe do a better job learning the practical things somewhere else. And uh, did you implement uh, dependently typed Lisp or was that a thing? Like how, um, how... yeah, tell, tell us about about the programming so, language that you use there. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we, we invented our own programming language for the book. And the reason we did this is because working in the core language of one of these type theories is extremely tedious. You have to write down a ton of details that where the then the, the implementation is going to go look and say like you know did essentially check did you write the same thing in these eight places yes you did gold star and uh, on the one hand we wanted to have short readable examples and on the other hand uh, we didn't want the book to be 800 pages so so that meant that we couldn't really use the existing systems and turn off all the fancy features on the other hand we um, we didn't want to use all the fancy features because there's other books that already do that. You know, if, if you want to learn how to how to do formalized mathematical proofs using dependent types, you know, you can look at like software foundations, type theory and formal proof, all these other. The, there's a bunch of these books out there these days, and so any of my colleagues and friends whose books I didn't just name, I apologize in advance because I didn't think of a list ahead of time. But um, what we really wanted to have. Uh, a, to just to do something different with this book that we didn't think that others were doing, and so we made our own language. And it's a lot of people think it's dependently typed Lisp, but I think for a language to count as Lisp, it should have a lot of these features. Like it should have parenthetical syntax. It should have a macro system. It should be dynamically typed. It should have, you know, first class functions, um, at least and. You know, Pi, the language we use in our book, isn't the Lisp, I don't think. Like, it has parenthetical syntax, and it has first-class functions, but none of the other things. Uh, we used a parenthetical syntax partly because we like it. Um, we, you know, I, I like writing Lisp. Uh, I write, I've written a fair bit of, like, racket code and Emacs Lisp and common Lisp back in the day. It's one of the languages that I love, in addition to Haskell and these dependently typed languages. Um, you know, Dan's whole career has been built around Lisp and Scheme. Um, so we, we, we both like that notation, but also we wanted to have a dependently typed language that was simple enough that people who read the book could understand how the implementation worked without needing to learn a lot of new concepts. 
And I think we were partially successful at that. We, we really wanted to have the whole source code to the implementation be in the end of the book, but it was too long. So we sort of transcribed it down into like mathematical rule notation. And then I wrote some supplementary tutorials and other materials to understand it, plus two sort of pedagogical implementations, one in Racket and one in Haskell. And one nice feature of parenthetical syntax is that a parser is very easy to write compared to something with operator precedence and infix things. So, you know, if, if you want to sit down and implement Pi in JavaScript, that would be awesome. And hopefully we've made your life easier by using the parenthetical syntax. That's really, that's really cool. And also, um, the full implementation is a nice, uh, is a nice appendix for, for the collector's edition. It's, uh... <laughs> Yeah, or or you can go on GitHub and download it and take a look at it. Uh, but there, there is a beauty, right? Uh, the, a couple of podcasts ago, my guest was a game designer, and he said that yeah. one of the reasons he really likes making physical board games is that um, with, with some of the digital artifacts, they kind of rot way quicker than paper, as it turned yeah. out. And uh, yeah. yeah, so, but, but uh, box with a board game, even right. and after a hundred of years, maybe some kid will discover it in the attic and learn the. So, yeah. Um, um, yeah. That's 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 a really really cool set of answers because yeah, for me my initial um, reaction was like, oh, wh why why not strip down some Idris or something like that and then show. That's that's yeah. a very very insightful thing. And also, um, it's really cool to learn that there are so many the little things. Which, which means that uh, I'll have a whole another um, series of books to read after I'm done with uh, Terry Pratchett's uh, novels. Nice. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a format that doesn't work for everyone. You know, I, I think people are pretty split on the little format, whether the, some people find the dialogue slow and maddening and they want to use it as a reference book and it doesn't work for that. Um, whereas other people sort of like the sort of drip by drip and the presentation style and the little side divergences so you know if you don't like it i'm not there is there is a but huh? have you read the little typer uh, no sadly not have you read the little typer it's okay now uh, especially it's on my bucket list um cool. yeah i mean that's that's the thing right like um it really depends of on when the where the person is standing uh, on the a spectrum of intermediacy right if a person is already yes. intermediate wiki yes. is enough right but i remember trying to learn the notion of a functor for the first time as a kid and it was just it, okay i was i was well into my 20s it was but. well i mean I'm, yeah i mean it's well actually the the way that the way i started learning haskell was uh, i was working um as a teenager i was working as a php programmer and um, a person who nice. who knew way more about computer programming told me that I write PHP as if, you know, I should go check out Haskell. He said, <laughs> uh, "Yeah, cool. but it was really difficult. We we barely had this um, yeah. um, learn yourself a Haskell book, right?" Oh, I didn't have that when I was learning. I had the 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 so called gentle oh. introduction. I if I, you remember that one. Maybe that's from before people's time. Like in the early 2000s, it was the, the tutorial. No, no, used. I, I used Haskell Wiki and uh, Learn Yourself a Haskell. And, okay. um, but Learn Yourself a Haskell is very dialogue-esque. It's very drip by drippy, right? Yeah. And it was very, very good f to, to understand stuff. But like when I, tr when I would try to like refer to, to Wiki as a complete beginner, it was just very hard. I guess we should go to more like non-Haskell, non-toy non okay. uh, world of like yeah. real defendant types and stuff. And um, real defendant um, types, okay. So first first thing that, that I personally am very like, I'm, I don't have a very good understanding of. So you mentioned uh, proofs or proof objects, right? That you sure. would attach to yeah. to uh, to statements sh demonstrating how how things of different of types depending on different values combine combine under some function, let's say, right? And would prove right of some okay. 
it would prove that the thing type checks, right? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't. No, it doesn't prove that the thing type checks. The uh, oh, thing sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. it would doesn't. prove that when we it would but, require but... me to submit something in addition to the values to demonstrate that. Uh... Yeah, you can formulate systems that way for sure, and that the type checker will make sure that your supposed yep. proof in fact is a proof and is it is it why uh kind of formal verification or like proof assistance come hand in hand with dependent types or so so the a lot of the initial interest in dependent types was from the from the perspective of people wanting to work on the philosophical project of the foundations of mathematics like if, if you read like Pam Martin Lewis early stuff, especially, like you can really see like a, a strong thread back to the early 20th century foundations project, sort of with some extra some extra um, tempering with like intuitionism and a bit of like phenomenology. Like you know, there's there's some marks from Husserl if you know where to look. And and so from the very start, I'd say it's actually not been thought of so much as a programming tool, but rather as a tool for doing mathematics. And and then eventually we get a machine where we can take this foundational theory and put it in and use it. And, you know, Cock from the start was a, a tool for doing math, not so much a programming language. Like you, you certainly write programs in it, but that's not so much what it was what it was really there for. And you know, if you read if you read papers on programming languages from the '90s, people will say like, "Oh, we can't do that because that would require dependent types," which is like clearly an absurd idea. <laughs> and you know, as opposed to today, when you read it, people are like, "We must do that because it requires dependent types." But um, but so so one I, I I think one place where this started to change, right, um, was like you know people were certainly writing programs in Cock. But they were writing programs in the subset of Cock that's very much like, you know, System F or ML, and then using the dependent types kind of on the side to prove properties about the program, and that's a really effective way to do things, and it works really well, and it's scaled up to like a full C compiler. Um, but but it wasn't so convenient to have programs that which were themselves dependently typed. So where a lot of these things come from is a system called Epigram, that was developed by Connor McBride and James McKenna. Um, and you know Edwin Brady worked on it, and a bunch of other people too. And Epigram was was never more, I think, than an artistic statement or a dream. I, I, I resurrected its code so it could build with modern GHCs. Uh, you do need to have Xemax installed to do to use its user interface, so that can be tough on newer computers. So I I haven't had time to port the UI to GNU Emacs, but but it's essentially using Xemax as like a dumb terminal with mouse support. And it's implemented the entire uh, editing thing behind the scenes, and it's got this 2D syntax and all sorts of cool stuff. But what it also has is a convenient notation for programming with dependent types using pattern matching and recursion that, that's nice to read and nice to use. And so it, that, and it was, you know, once Epigram had sort of made its artistic statement, then we started getting things like the equations package in Coq, and we got Agda2 and Idris and, and Lean, which take a lot of the techniques and a lot of the thoughts from Epigram and sort of build on build further on them. And now we have convenient programming with dependent types like for, you know, depending on, on who you are and what you find convenient, but certainly for things that I find convenient in, in all of those languages. So it really came from the math to the programming rather than the other way around. That's really that's that's really interesting. Uh, so and when when we if we circle back to um, to ergonomic dependent types in Haskell. Um, yeah. You mentioned pr figuring out trade-offs for uh, proof objects there as well, right? Uh, is how, the way I imagine it, and this is a, the continuation of, the, of this question, right? For me, um, mm. it's um, very difficult to understand straight away um, how would we, for example, take some uh, bytes da, uh, from the wire and transform them into a particular, or parse them into a particular dependently typed object. Now that, I'm, uh, now that I use the term parsing, sure. perhaps exactly like that. Perhaps we will have parser, which yes. will have, as you mentioned, like branching. Uh, yeah. 
uh, stuff. That's right. Um, and then we'll be able to use this values of these types. Let's say uh, if we use the handy list n to mm -hmm. to then go to the pure world of our programs and and to use it as uh, this object with the dependently typed object as, as arguments. Sure. But where do where do proof objects come come into play here? I kind of can't see them. Yeah. So where proof objects are going to come into play is typically like when you're doing programming, then the proof objects are typically showing up in a context where the types don't quite line up for reasons that the compiler can't figure out on its own. Right. So so when you're running a type checker. Like anytime you design a type checker, there's sort of two questions to, to figure out how to answer. One of them is when are two types considered to be equivalent to one another? And the other is when and how do I check that? And and those are sort of the like the, 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 the your answers to those will guide the design of the rest of your type checker. And um, it happens to be the case that any sort of sufficiently interesting type checker is gonna disappoint you when when, when talking about when are two things considered the same. And, and and you're going to be disappointed because you want it to do sort of arbitrary mathematical reasoning for you, but any type checker that actually did that would be either slow or error prone or tend to fall into loops. And, and there's, there's practical reasons why you can't do it. And also, like, depending on your language, mathematical reasons why you can't, like, you could solve the halting problem. And so... The, so what you end up with is an equational theory of the values inside of the types that is somehow insufficient, but the, that the machine can check on its own. And then you have all the other things that you would like the type checker to con consider to be equal to one another, but where you've got to give it some evidence that it can check. And, and so, so on the one side, you've got the things that, are, that just are the same as each other. And then on the other, you've got the things that... Um, that are equivalent in some way that requires you to do the work, and then the and then the computer just checks that you did the work right. And the so so equality proof objects are the the evidence that is used to equate two things that the compiler can't see are the same on its own. Um, other kinds of proof objects you might have, um, you know, you can you can start you can start embedding you know, your various logical operators like. Um, conjunction you get by having like and by having a pair of proofs of, of the two things that are being conjoined uh, disjunction or you get by having essentially the either type with with the proofs in each branch um, implication you get out of a function um, a dependent function gives you universal quantification um, the 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 empty type you know the thing we call void in haskell is uh, false like the false proposition um, you know, saying that a thing implies false is a negation. And so in some sense, there isn't really like, a, it, there isn't a formal notion of what constitutes a proof object. I'd, I'd say it's a pragmatic thing. Like, how are you using it in your program? In the same sense that like, it's not always clear, like what is business logic and what is configuration? Like it, it's kind of a fuzzy boundary. Uh, some languages give you specific technical means of marking the proofs. Um, like in, in Cock and in Lean, you have this notion of, of, of a type being a proposition and then types that are propositions have some special effects related to them. But, but generally speaking, you might also want to write proofs that aren't propositions and in both those systems anyway. So I think it's really That's... a pragmatic question. Like, are you using this for its logical power rather than That's just a very, very data? nice and insightful question. And so, so I'm, I'm, so we can say that because this is, I think it's familiar to most of our uh, listeners who are uh, Haskell professionals, right? When when GHC can't figure something out, you say you even say something as, as simple as like column column type somewhere, and then it's like oh okay, so some, some, sometimes it can, it can infer something, right? And and this may be uh, yeah. applied to inference, right? Uh, this. It, it, it is, but problem, I yeah. think that it's also like uh, very interesting to to observe that it has kind of the similar 
like reasons behind it right yeah. so sometimes yeah so 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 sure. um um okay that's that's cool that's that's interesting um yeah um so many of us already have experienced something similar to to writing like a proof object and a dependent independent haskell in, in, our, in our work when when we were when we would deal with inference right i kind of want to already uh, start talking about lean but i don't think that it's fair to 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 skip idris because um um, I it just is cool. Yeah, like it is. It, it is very cool, and and you have contributed to it a little bit, right? Um, so I, I contributed, I'd say, a fair bit to oh. the first version of Idris, and almost nothing to the second. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I don't know if it's still the case, but last I looked, I had second most commits on Idris one after the main developer Edwin Brady. Um, I started off when I was at a summer school during a, my PhD program, where Edwin was teaching a little tutorial on using Idris and. There was no tab completion at the REPL, and that bothered me, so I was like, all right, I'm going to make a pull request. I was like, that was kind of fun. Okay. Uh, and then I just kind of got carried away, and it ended up taking over my entire PhD project because I was working on, like, a DSL thing, and I was like, okay, I wanted a dependent type in the DSL. How do I implement that? Maybe I can reuse bits of Idris. How do I reuse bits of Idris in a principled way? Hmm, let's do some meta program. And, and it just kind of escalated from there, um, where... Um, you know, so so working on Idris, I did. Uh, I, you know, I, I I had a lot of fun working on the interactive experience, like the, uh, like the the sort of Emacs based IDE that I was contributing to. Like we, I did features like interactive error messages. So if you had you could like right click on a term in an error message and like normalize it in place without leaving the context of the error. That was really That's fun. That's so good. Um, but um, and then. Uh, and you know, I also I did the the meta programming system and the there's essentially the ability to do unsafe perform IO in the type system was my master's thesis because <laughs> I, I was trying to do something kind of like F sharps type providers but with ha without having it be a code generation step. Um, I don't know that we have time to actually get into what those are, but type providers is a super cool feature in F sharp. So people listening who don't know what it is should go check it out. All right. Um... Um, but yeah, I, I was working on other things and then Idris 2 got developed and it's got a lot of really nice features, but I, I just haven't had the time to work on it, unfortunately. And so I, I also recommend checking out Idris 2. Right. Maybe, maybe, um, maybe if you, if you, would, uh, if you'll teach at some summer school, maybe you'll inspire someone to, uh, to, to look at Idris 2 and, uh, go uh, and fall down. There are the more qualified thing. people than me, <laughs> but I mean, but yeah. I don't think we should, um, um, like I mean, I, obviously there are yeah. a lot of more qualified people than me to teach Haskell, but like still, whenever okay. I get the chance to yeah. to to teach yeah. Haskell, I do. Uh, sure. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, before we go to Lena, I would like to ask that uh, a question about meta programming. You mentioned meta programming yeah. uh, related to Idris, and in general, is when we when we look at Haskell, right? We we see that there is like there are mechanisms like quasi quotation, whatever it means, right? Mm -hmm. And then we have um, some sort of like compile time code generation with template with Haskell. Haskell. Um, and then, but then we have also just you know deriving, which is also mm -hmm. a meta programming tool. Um, yeah, maybe you can. Tell me or our and or uh, our listeners a little bit about uh, how how would it look in, in a language like Idris with like dependent types and stuff. And is there a significant difference between what we have in Haskell and there? Mm, yes and no. So so the thing I did for Idris was it it fulfills the same kind of a role that template Haskell fulfills in Haskell. It um, so, so in, in, in these dependent type languages, there's typically like a small little core language, kind of like the role system FC plays in GHC. And then you have, when you're type checking the program that the user writes, you generate code in that core language because it's much easier to, to do everything for a small language than for a big language. And particularly if you're using proofs, then you're uh, in a better position to trust that your proof checking system is correct if, the, if it's very small. And so the system that does that translation and type checking at the same time is called an elaborator. 
And the Idris Elaborator had a bunch of nice features. And what I essentially did was made that available to Idris programs so that you could use the features implemented to implement Idris to implement your own things. That was, uh, that was actually how I met uh, the, the Lean developers because they were working on a sort of a simple, a very similar design that ended up being the tactic language in Lean 3 that we, and we met up at Popple in Paris and said hello. And that's how I got to know, to know them. And, and they, they, you know, we, we were sort of independently arriving at, at, at fairly similar ideas. Um, theirs ended up being fast and having a profiler so, and, and a debugger. So like they, they definitely uh, did really cool stuff there, but, um, but yeah, so the, but metaprogramming in general is a very broad term, right? Like you've got, um, you've got sort of the, the the Lisp and Racket style approach where you've got macros and hygiene and little bits of code that expand to other ones. Um, you've got the, the sort of template Haskell style approach where you expose a chunk of the compiler to the program and let it do what it wants uh, at compile time, all sorts of stuff. Um, it's it's generally it's like making programs that make other programs is better programming you know it's d++ has its templates there, there's a lot of ways to do all this and um, if you're interested in what we did for Idris, you could talk you may want to go look at my talk from icfp at 2016 where i've got a a quick run through of, of what that work was all right um yeah that's that that's certainly is very interesting by the way well when when i look at one of my favorite languages with very good metaprogramming facilities, Lisp style, is um, Elixir. Um, mm. And um, it's like, its syntax is really weird, right? It's like basically kind of Ruby-ish, but um, it it does exactly the Lisp style metaprogramming. Um, and obviously it has the luxury of being like dan uh, dynamically typed, so it doesn't really need to worry about like uh, macros and, and yeah. typing macros. I wonder though, um, there is someone, I think Alex is king, or I think mm -hmm. is very keen on bringing that style of macros in Haskell eventually. Um, and she has a lot of like, may, maybe I'm confusing uh, uh, her with someone else, but, but there is this. Alexis has deep, deep knowledge of racket style metaprogramming and of Haskell and of GHC, and I know that her she has interest in these things. I I don't know if she's working on that particular thing at the moment, but I think you're thinking of the right all right. Person. So, and and for me, I wrote quite some uh, macros in like pro, like because when we write like macros in C or we write uh, macros in pure Erlang or we write macros in like C plus plus or Rust, it's horrible. It's not good. It's like it's just you want to stop, right? Like you want to go have a breath of fresh air but when we write the macros in lisp or in elixir uh we just want to keep going because it's fun right i yeah. wonder if there is this uh um so you said that you don't know if, if she's working on this stuff but do you think like as a kind of researcher right do you think it's even feasible to have lisp style macros for languages like ours yes absolutely um lean lean 4 has them um, uh, if you want to do it for Hindley Milner style languages, there's, uh, an unsolved research question that back when I, back before I had a, a, a child, I had a little bit of time to try to work on this and my collaborator, Samuel Jelena was still working on it. We have this little, so, so the problem with a Hindley Milner style language is that type information flows in unexpected directions and if you want, and, and it's unclear how to keep principal typing and have macros that can observe types. Um, you know, Samuel had this idea of essentially when a macro tries to observe a type that happens to be an unsolved meta variable, then it pauses and gets resumed when the type becomes known. And we've got a part, you know, an implementation of that, which is this little language called Klista, which, but it's, you know, we haven't like done the formal math and the proofs yet to show that it in fact still has principal typing and all these other nice features but um so I, I think there's some interesting research work still to be done absolutely but but like languages with types can absolutely have you know lisp and scheme style macros that's amazing and so when you're saying that um 
um, I'm, I'm sorry for not, not being educated enough uh, to well, nobody knows to, to understand um, the difference between so so when when you when you're t when you're distinguishing this uh, approach to type inference from between Haskell and Lean, uh, you, you mean that Lean has a different sure. approach to it, and, and what's what's the difference? Can you talk a little bit about it? Yeah, sure. So, so languages in the in the broad ML family are typically based around the sort of what people call like the Hindley Damas Milner type system, where which has a, a number of nice features. One of them is that you have principal typing, which means that every program has a single most general type that you can assign, like sort of either that or has a type error. And additionally, we have an efficient algorithm to discover said principal type, and uh, dependently type languages sort of in the in the sort of tradition of like Martin of type theory and the calculus of constructions just absolutely do not have principal typing. Like a given program could have lots of types and there's not not necessarily one of them that's better than the others. And this means that type inference becomes uh, like a best effort kind of thing rather than something you can always rely on solidly all the time. And this means that you lose some properties like with a Hindley Miller style system, you can change the order that the type checker traverses the program. Like maybe you, it starts going left to right, you make it go right to left. Uh, or maybe like depth first instead of breadth first. And the error messages that it produces in the case of a type error might be different. But if the program doesn't have type errors, then you're still gonna get the same types out. Uh, and that's just not the case for the other systems. So that means that you are essentially fixing the order that the type checker goes in, which means that meta programs have a predictable model, kind of, which is the implementation of the type checker. Whereas uh, in a Hindley Milner style system, you don't you you really want to preserve that nice property of being able to switch around the guts of the type checker without breaking people's programs. And so if you expose that information to the meta program, then you remove that ability. So, so yeah, given that we can traverse these things in any direction, that means that, sorry, given that we can only traverse the program in the expected direction when we're doing these dependently type languages, then that means that the particular meta programming issue doesn't pop up. That's cool. Um, I actually didn't think about it. Uh, the so the sort of canonicity of of types so do you understand correctly that like the simplest illustration would be that let's say um i have a dependent type that says that something has at most n elements and then i have something that has three elements now this something that has three elements has infinite amount of types that it has at most five elements. It has at most 300 so, elements. So that's an example of what you're talking about, right? Or, or is... Mm -hmm. that, yeah. 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 I mean, Modulo quibbles about the specific way you encode it in all these yeah, different yeah. varied systems. But yeah. That's, that's, exactly. that's a very interesting... I never thought about it even. That's, that's a really cool thing to, to, to think about how it's... The implications to type inference. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's, that's really cool. Um, also, you're, you're saying... Uh, you're mentioning uh, Lean 3 and Lean 4. And I only yeah. learned about uh, Lean um, this year, I think. And it's already Lean 4. Oh. <laughs> how come? Yeah. What, was I living under the rock? Like, how, why, why, why are we not all hyped about it? Um, I don't know why you're not hyped about it. Um, so, so Lean 1 and Lean 2, are. I never used them. I think my, my understanding is that they didn't have many users beyond Leo. Uh, Leonardo de Mora is the main developer of Lean. Um, he's previously one of the main developers of Z3. And, you know, he was... And, and Lean kind of started its life being more of, uh, like, an automated proof tool and less of one of these proof assistant style programming language situations. And, and over time, it's just evolved more in the direction of interactive proof while trying to do, you know, still trying to do good automation, but automation and type theory are, are just hard to combine, so... Um, and I think Lean 3 was the first version that had a significant number of users outside of MSR. And um, 
it's still the the mature the mature choice. Uh, Lean Four is particularly interesting to me because first off, it has a macro system inspired by rackets, which um, is one of my deep loves in the programming world. It's also interesting because it's self-hosting. So they're, you know, it's implemented in itself, and that has forced them to think hard about a lot of implementation choices. Um, Idris 2 is also implemented in itself, by the way. Um, you know, it's got a nice interactive environment and, and all these things written in Lean. And I, one, of, one of my dreams is, you know, turtles all the way down. Like, I want to be able to tear apart my compiler and tweak it and mess with it in the language that I'm working on. And Lean 4 seems like a nice step in that direction. And you're writing a book about it, right? Yeah, so Microsoft Research is sponsoring me to write an introductory book on using Lean 4 as a programming language. So uh, Lean has been sort of blessed for a long time with having mathematicians who are interested in using it. Um, so, you know, like um, Kevin Buzzard on got, got into Lean 3. I'm not entirely sure why he picked that one I, instead of Cock or whatever, but... But, have, but he, he's, he's done a good job getting other mathematicians on board. And so an interesting thing about Lean in contrast to these other systems is that it's got a lot of mainstream mathematicians involved. You know, people who, who don't think classical logic is dirty and in fact are kind of suspicious of why you w would even consider not using classical logic. Uh, and, and that's led to some interesting different trade-offs in the design of Lean that weren't made in other systems, which is good because as a community, we explore more of the design space for these languages. Um, and uh, it's also led to sort of, or I'd say Lean has been less of a programming language in the past, but once it became self-hosting, it had to suddenly be more of a programming language. Uh, and they wanted a resource to for so that programmers could get involved with lean who didn't have a background in you know high level mathematics and who didn't have a background in type theory and all those sorts of things because mathematicians need programmers to help them with metaprogramming sometimes because a big part of what you want to do is automate your proofs so that you don't have to sit down and type out every case by hand um you know a lot of mathematicians have programming experience in python or something like that. And, you know, they're not Haskellers. So learning materials that assume you know what a monad is from the programming perspective aren't going to be useful. Um, at the same time, if, if you want to recruit people to work on Lean, which is written in Lean, um, and they're very, very good C++ programmers, but don't have a deep background in functional programming, there, there wasn't a resource. And so I'm trying to write a book for people who know how to program, but who haven't done any functional programming in the past to sort of learn functional programming in the context of Lean and writing programs with Lean. That's really cool. And, and also you are describing the, the goals that you have for the book. And um, I didn't read the introduction, but I read the first and second chapters. And I, I, I want Thanks. to say that uh, so far you're hitting the, the nail on the head. Uh, I don't know if yes. it's... Except you know functional programming already, uh, so you're not but, part of the audience. Sure, but the thing is that I could infer your goals from, from reading, like, for example, how you wrote, like, chapter two. Great. It's, like, all about, like, okay, mm -hmm. let's do some I.O., you know, like yeah. how you, in the first chapter, for example, how um, you, 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 you tell people, okay, let's, here's how you make a structure. You might see these errors. He, this is what they mean. It doesn't matter for the time being. Mm. You know, just like <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. very, very, very good read. I think Thanks. it's uh, it's going to be um, it's like it's going to address the the, the objectives that you set for it. Great. Um, yeah. So one thing that's kind of fun about the about the process of writing this is that I actually wrote lean macros to test all of those error messages. So the, the lean metaprogramming and the lean macro system is powerful enough that I wrote a little macro where I put, I, I write a, a, a lean declaration and then I write a string next to it and that string says what the error message that it emits should be. And then um, if the thing doesn't make an error message, then that becomes an error and it fails. If it makes a different error message, then it fails. Uh, but if it makes the same error message, then it's as if I never wrote the declaration at all. And, and the type checker will just continue. And, you know, this was like 
maybe a 10 line macro. Um, and that way I can make sure that the text of the book keeps up with all the improvements they're making to the error messages in the lean team. That's, that's very cool. Yeah, so, so every, every, every couple of weeks I'll go and I'll say like, okay, use the nightly from today. And then, and then all the error messages will break and I'll go and fix them. That's, that's a very, very, very cool thing. That's a lot yeah. Fun. I mean, um, I actually do something similar when, when I would need to program Elixir. So I would, hmm. obviously we have it very difficult there because it's dynamically typed and it's like, you never, you never know what you're running. Um, and this is why in my dog tests, I encode line numbers in my, in my tests. So, oh. and, um, um, and I, for things that are error out, I take stack trace at test time, not compile time. Yeah. And I, if there is a divergence between line numbers, I know at least that I changed something there. And yeah. then and it's yeah. uh, just another check nice. to, to, to go and look at this file and to make sure that the tests are yeah. up to date. I love stuff like this. That's, that's a very smart thing to do. Yeah. If you have like this macro or like a blog post about it, please share. We will include it in the notes. I don't. It's it's the I don't have the source code of the book publicly oh, available. Okay. Partly because there's a, there's some really hastily written Python code with some really really impenetrable regular expressions that sort of assembles the various pieces of the book with the various example source files and I uh, I don't have a lot of time to work on the book because you know I've got a full-time I've got a full-time job and I have a two-year-old and and then I that only leaves a few hours a week to actually do the writing work and if I have to spend a lot of time doing tech support on the meta programs then I just won't have any time to get any writing done so it, it's sort of being being secretive at this point is a bit of a self-defense mechanism that's fair but, enough we'll wait uh, but at some point it will come out it's just not, but, not yet. but I absolutely love rolling release uh, it's like um you know, I don't know if there is RSS, but like it could be a nice, um, you know, we, yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah, I should look into seeing what it would take to put an RSS feed up for the book. Otherwise, you can follow me on Twitter. I don't actually post that often, but I do announce oh, that's uh, cool. book releases. And I announce them on the Lean Zulip. Okay, we'll put we'll, we'll put the links in the, in, in the, in the description cool. of the podcast. Um, so... One of the things you mentioned about the costs of, of dependent types is that uh, they slow comp the compiler down. I don't think it's... Um, they don't necessarily slow down the compiler, but they can. Like, it's, it's certainly not the case that every program with dependent types in it compiles slowly. However, um, the harder you make a compiler work, the slower it's going to get. And the ability to put programs in your types means that the type checker has to run your programs. And... You can always write a slow program. Like maybe you want to, you know, like call Ackerman of 30 as part of your type. It's, there's nothing that's going to make that yeah. fast. And you can also always depend on the library that uh, that does this, right? So, Absolutely, um, yeah. But uh, Rust, the success, success of Rust, I think, has demonstrated us but people really don't care about long compilation times. Okay, I'm not dunking on Rust, but anyway. Um, um, yeah, I think that I think that's. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I just, I mean, I, my my experience is I, I use Rust once a year to play ICFPC, mm -hmm. uh, which, by the way, is on this year on September second till September fifth. Um, if you are interested, join our team. <laughs> Link in the description. <laughs> I have no time whatsoever. Maybe some of our listeners. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, uh, and, and there, you know, day one, it's fine. We have no dependencies. Everything compiles quick, fast. And then, like, this, the second Tokyo sneaks in somewhere. Ugh. And if you're in the competitive setting, you just have 70 hours to do stuff. Like, mm. long, long compilation times is just mm. really annoying. So this is why, uh, in part, I'm like, I'm half joking, right? But but uh, yeah. but what people seem to care about a lot is is performance. So do, would you say that, for example, in Lean Four in particular, like how does it handle the runtime? And do you think that yeah. um, uh, do you think that uh, it's feasible industrially from the performance standpoint? 
again, like feasible industrially. Like people, people always ask, like, is this production ready? Um, I think the answer with Lean Four is like definitely not. It's it's not formally released yet. Like it's it's in like pre-release mode. You know, the the stable version is still Lean Three. I would not build a business around software written in Lean Four today, simply because the cost of keeping up with the compiler changes would be way too high. Um, let alone all the other issues that you might have. Um, you know, it's 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 just it's not done yet, but and that's okay. Like it'll be done someday. Uh, but the the basic design is going to be, uh, I, I think, reasonably fast for a lot of purposes. I, I right, like there's um, there's so there's a few challenges that come up. Right, one one thing is uh, that type erasure is an interesting problem for dependently typed languages because type erasure also means value erasure, and you have to think carefully about which parts of the program survive to runtime and which ones don't. Right, like in in Hindley Milner. You just delete all the types, and the rest of the program survives. Um, but that's not going to work in a dependently typed language because you know maybe the type is being passed as an argument, and that matters. Or you know you've got numbers that exist only to please the compiler, and you want those numbers to get erased. All that stuff. And so I think Idris 2's quantitative type theory is a very interesting uh, answer to this, where you can say in the type signature which parts of the program survive and which parts don't to runtime. Um, I think uh, Koch and Lean have this notion of, uh, of like propositions which can get erased, which is also useful. But at the end of the day, like part of the answer is going to be that it depends on the program you're writing and like some advance in compiler technology. But, but once you've, but once you've figured out your erasure situation, I think that the research community has reasonable answers to this these days. Um, then you've got a programming language that is a lot like getting OCaml to run fast. And plenty of businesses can use something like OCaml. You know, and like OCaml is, I, I think, a really good example here because it's got a nice simple compilation mechanism that's easy to understand. You know, you can mostly look at a program and know what's going to happen at runtime. Um, you know, like there are certain programs that I wouldn't write in OCaml where, you know, like where a garbage collector isn't going to work, for example, you know, for that, I definitely want to use Rust. Um, but I think that, you know, like Lean is essentially a strict functional programming language when you come right down to it. Um, it's got a, a kind of an interesting allocator based on reference counting. And the reason why reference counting is, is interesting here is that one of the big drawbacks of reference counting is cyclic data. You know, you get these cycles and you need like a traditional collector to collect them, but you can't actually write cyclic data in Lean. It's impossible. So, so that's no issue, <laughs> um, right? And that and that's due to the like termination checking that you get from a dependently typed language. And so, because you can't write cyclic data, that big disadvantage goes away. And when you have reference counting then you can actually check, is this reference count exactly one and about to go to zero? And if it's about to go to zero, then you can mutate the object in place instead of like deleting and allocating a new one. And that means that you can achieve, uh, what do you say, runtime mutability with logical immutability and kind of get maybe not the best of both worlds, but some good stuff from each. So I think, yeah, I haven't... I don't have any experience in writing lean code that has to go super fast. However, the lean compiler is mostly written in lean. I use it on a regular basis and it's plenty fast. So, so I, I really, you know, like I suspect that, you know, once this is, this is me guessing now. Right. But, but I guess that, you know, once, once the dust settles and things are mature, probably lean code is going to go a fair bit faster than like similar Python code. And, a fair bit slower than similar V8 code or similar JavaScript code because probably less work will be put into a compiler for it. And that's going to be fast enough for a great number of businesses and a great number of industrial production Absolutely. use cases. Yeah, that's that's a very, very good uh, and very uh, inspiring assessment. Um, yeah, that's that's that. Uh, I don't have any follow-up questions. And okay. also, thank you very much for uh, talking a little bit about the the cool reference counting trick. I guess my only follow up is, yeah. uh, and I'm a little bit confused here. So I see how we sure. can't um, define like cyclic. I don't know, like 
structures or something like this, but we do have mutual recursion, right? In Lin. Sort okay, of. Okay, so what do you mean? You have to prove that, that your recursive functions terminate, and that's part of keeping the logic consistent. And in a strict functional language, the only the only reasonable way to make an actual cycle is to have a reference cell, a mutable reference cell. Yeah, you know, so you can do it with like, you know, a ref in OCaml or something, right? Like in, in a lazy language, you can absolutely do all these not tying tricks, but but in a strict language, you don't get to do that. You just have an infinite loop at runtime if you try to make something like that. And you know, the infinite loop gets ruled out by the termination checker. If you're if, you know, if you're saying in the in the safe subset at least. And and you don't have reference cells, so yeah. And if you're if you're breaking and, and you know like there are like unsafe perform IO kind of stuff in Lean, and that indeed lets you break the invariance that the language's runtime depends on. That sort of in the name unsafe perform IO, and you know you can break those invariants and probably you could do something interesting. But I mean, we can we can write a socket acceptor, right? Yeah. For example, we sometimes want yeah. to go infinite. Which is which brings me to, to another yeah, yeah. question like uh, so infinite data like cyclic data is different from true, infinite yeah. programs right but uh, but uh, yeah. with what uh, I asked about recursion yeah if with, uh, with infinite data okay it's understandable yeah. uh, I asked about recursion and you said well you want you need to prove termination and my question now yes. is like what if I don't want to prove termination right what if I just want to sure how uh, do you write a web server yeah. the classic question okay so. So I'm going to zoom out from lean a little bit here because different systems have different answers. So one way you can do it is you build an escape hatch into the language and you say that like I'm going to decorate this function and say that it's partial. Um, and, and for the Haskellers listening, in Haskell, when people talk about partial functions, they usually mean incomplete pattern matches, whereas in dependently typed settings, people usually mean functions that are not that are that are not sort of mathematically total. So infinite loops also make you partial. And so you say, like, I'm going to declare this partial, allow it to be partial, and then I'll write it the way I write any other program with an infinite loop in it, and I'm done. Um, and, and that's what you'd have to do in Lean, because Lean doesn't have the other thing you can do, which is to use what's called co-inductive data types. And co-inductive data types are infinite data that um, where functions over them have to be able to observe a finite prefix of it in finite time. And so there, what you what you do is you. I'm sorry. As, as far as I understand, your... uh, yeah. Haskellers in the audience will recognize their favorite list in your co-inductive uh, explanation. So lists yes. in Haskell are so, co-inductive, so... actually. I think. Y yes, basically. Um, so like, ha I mean, Haskell doesn't give you like a co-inductive reasoning principle of lists. So, but they, they work very much like, like. Ordinary data types in Haskell work very much like co-data types in Idris or Agda or something, or Conk. Um, Lean just doesn't have them. Um, I think Lean 3 has one of them, which is infinite streams. But I and, and you can do some tricks to encode various ones. I'm actually not entirely sure what the state of the art is, but you can't just sit down and declare, here's my co-data type in Lean 4, at least. And so, But in language where you can do that, there you can define uh, a, a type which is essentially like a stream of input output actions that could go on either infinitely or potentially infinitely and then because your web server like you don't actually want it to fall into an infinite loop right like you want it to serve an unbounded number of requests but you don't want it to just like sit there you know incrementing an integer forever until it wraps around and then continue to integrate it in increment it so there really like you know, this principle that you can observe a finite prefix in finite time is actually much nicer than you can write arbitrary, arbitrarily, you know, looping stuff. Assuming that the language is otherwise ergonomic to use. And that is a real question that you have to worry about. But That's really cool. I, I didn't, I thought about co-inductives for streams, but I didn't think about that the web server is actually, uh, is a good representation for a web server. Hmm. I think it was Anton Setzer and Peter Dubier, but I could be misremembering because it's a few years since I've read it. So apologies if I got it wrong, uh, which talks about how to write generally uh, effectful programs. And you can actually encode IO as a conductive type. 
because you can see IO as being a system where you have like a data type that represents commands, and then you have a function from a command to the type of the response you get from the system. You know, so for like get line, that might be string, and for print line, it might be unit. And then you can define a program, like you can define a program that does IO as essentially being an infinitely branching tree. Or you can see you can see the world as like an infinitely branching tree. And then you like observe down one branch of that tree. And then the types tell you what you'll get back as a value. And then you can, depending on that, and it's, it's really cool. Did they, define, did they define an illustrative language in this paper? I think... Think. Wasn't there something like lambda i or something? So, I don't remember. I'm sorry. It's it's let, been let, about... Let's try to after the show. Let's try yeah. to exchange the papers because I have one of my favorite papers. Yeah, we'll, 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 one we'll of my favorite link, yeah. papers does very a very similar thing, um, and I also okay. don't remember the whole de all of the details. So we should we should link this stuff. Yeah. It's it's like okay. I love stuff like this. It's, yes. It's, yeah. As I said, one of my favorite papers does a very yeah. similar, similar thing. Let's let's talk about, um, I guess, features of Lean Four. And I mean, it's, I kind of just my questions are just from me, <laughs> because I just played with it a little bit based on your first ch two chapters and like, uh, and and stuff I care about a lot. So um, as a as a as a young adult, I tried to write a game in Haskell, and I wanted to have rooms. And I want an infocom like game, like um, basically a text yeah, yeah, adventure. Yeah. And I wanted to to have rooms, and I wanted rooms to have different things in them. And I wanted to encode these things mm -hmm. at the type system level. And I didn't know about existential uh, quantification back then, so mm -hmm. I failed to do it because you can't put an A and a yeah. B in a list of A. Um, sure. Well, you can if you have. Yeah, yeah, type, yeah. But right? but and I wanted to do it under expression but, yeah. problem about which I also didn't yeah, yeah. know. But I wanted to make yeah, new yeah. rooms. Right. Uh, so. Right. Um, so um, and when when I played with with Lin a little bit, uh, I I got fascinated about how easy it is to represent essentially existential types with. Um, mm -hmm. um, with just a simple, uh, you know, just a simple structure which uh, takes a type in its field, right? Sure. Um, but what I noticed is that when I do that, I get some error messages because it says, uh, you know, I want yeah. type, but you give me type one. So what's the story here? Sure. Is it related to your uh, the thing that you said before about and how in Haskell type? of type is type and yes. yeah <laughs> tell our tell our it is uh, audience a little bit about this stuff yeah so back back at the dawn of uh of martin Dove's type theory there was a version which had this rule that type had type type and you could just sort of write generic things that took types of arguments and pass them around but it turns out that this is logically inconsistent because by working hard enough you can encode an infinite loop and so the the technical thing that was and, and and this is like very similar to Russell's paradox, you know. So the 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 set of all sets that don't contain themselves does it contain itself? Yes, but then it can't. No, but then it must. Um, it, it, it's sort of a, a very it's a related topic to that, and and, and just as um, as the the original type theory was in, was invented to take care of of that problem of impredicativity and set theory. Um, we ended up with uh, a way. We, we ended up with a way to rule out this sort of arbitrary impredicative quantification. So, impredicative versus predicative quantification says, when I'm going to say for all x in blah, is blah allowed to be the same kind of thing that I'm in the process of defining, or does it have to be a smaller thing? And predicative means it has to be in some sense smaller. And impredicative says that I get to talk about the thing that I'm in from the perspective of myself. And you know, impredicativity is great if you can make it work, but it comes with technical challenges that can make your system inconsistent and thus useless for math. Um, 
And so it turns out that the, the initial version of quantum lift type theory was impredictive and had a consistency problem. So, so we ended up then with a system of universes, they're called, where a where each universe... And there's, this is another one of those areas where the design space varies quite a lot and different choices are made in Koch and Agda and Lean and Idris, all of them. Uh, but the basic idea is that you can't talk about something that's your own size when you're defining yourself. And so in the case where you're defining, where you def probably defined a record type with one projection that is a type and another projection that is an inhabitant of that type to do your existential type, then that record type itself would have to have a, a bigger universe. It has to be a part of a bigger notion of type so that it doesn't end up with being contained in itself. And thus you avoid all these paradoxes. Um, and normally in Lean, you actually wouldn't say this is in type one or in type two. Normally what you do is you define a system of constraints. So you'd say that, um, that this type field is in type U and my overall structure is in type U plus one. And then that, that gives you a kind of polymorphism which allows you to then use this in type zero or actually not in type zero because it says U plus one, but you could use it in type one, type two, type five. And so what you end up doing is essentially defining an infinite number of copies of this type simultaneously across all the different universe levels that it could inhibit. And that sounds like a big scary thing, but it's very much like when you define a polymorphic function in Haskell. Like identity is actually defined for every single type in Haskell. It's just you know, because it's polymorphic. So it's that basic idea just for these universes rather than for the than for individual yeah. types. And and now you can if you if you're writing like the sort of universe polymorphic code, you can uh, put this structure uh, into like a, another universally polymorph sorry universe polymorphic structure as a, as a type for example yeah. parameter like for example I can make so let's say I have like the structure E which has this associated type inside hidden inside uh, which as you said is in type one or is in type u plus one if my associated type is in universe u now i can make lists of list of those because list is also defined in a universe polymorphic way right that's yeah, the, that's right yeah, mm -hmm. um on the other hand this is not how i would ever write this code the way i would write this code is i would because normally you actually don't want to be able to put any type in there normally you want to put sort of some interesting subset of types in there. So going back to our example of the interpreter for the programming language where we have a data type representing the programming language's type, like I think it was nat, bool, and functions, and then a function mapping those to real types. But like, let's say you wanna sort of existentially quantify that. Then what you do is you have the first field be that data type. And then you say that the second field, you find its type by calculating based on that code that you put in the first field. And once you do that, then a lot of these size problems go away because now you're not storing a type. You're storing a piece of data that represents types. And that, and that way you get rid of the universe lift. Nice, nice. And, and that doesn't work in every case, but it yeah. works in quite a lot of Well, things. I was very um, un, uneducated industrially. So I was always wanted to write like gen general stuff. So this is why my life was hell before I... Uh, discovered uh, Wadler's uh, expression problem email because I thought that intuitively I thought that there must be a solution in any language I'm using right but uh, so it was relieving to to understand that sometimes we just have to like go for a closed type right and yeah. then we'll extend our functionality by refactoring and we have beautiful facilities for refactoring yeah in, in Haskell and ML languages so Absolutely. Especially in Haskell, yeah. I think. We don't have beautiful facilities for automatic refactoring, right? Like hair exists and HLS does some cool things, but we're still we're still a ways from what you could do with Kotlin and IntelliJ. But right, hopefully right. that will change. But, uh, but yeah, manual refactoring. But manual refactoring, like where the compiler yeah. helps you not screw it up. That that's uh, great. But yeah, honestly, I want to say that for this particular thing of making rooms that can have that can kind of store different things while still being rooms without type classes yeah. because if let's say i don't want to use type classes it was like sure. I, it's so easy i i was very very happy with with how 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 easy it is with lin um okay um 
so um you mentioned when you were talking about haskell how haskell is like really really good for one two three four right so um you mentioned type classes there right and uh, type classes are used and abused and hated and loved by many but at the end of the day if we look at any sufficiently large let's say haskell code base full of type classes um so what's the situation lean as far as type classes go and uh, how is subtyping handled, stuff like this? Type classes exist in Lean. Um, it's different than Haskell in a few ways. One is that there are, is that the arguments to a type class need not be types because, you know, like, for example, you could put a number in there as well. Like, because why not? You know, we have data at the type level. Um, or rather, I should say that there is no fundamental distinction between the levels in the way there is in something like Haskell. Um, so like the equivalent of, of like from integer in Haskell in lean is actually a type class called of nat and it takes the actual nat as an argument. So like, let's say you have a data type that only represents the even numbers. You can just make it odd literals be a type error, which is pretty cool. Um, and, uh, but lean doesn't have a notion of like unique or like, uh, of like unique implementations of type classes. You know, so 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 a given a given type class resolution problem might have many instances that satisfy it, and then you can give the lean compiler some priorities to pick between them, and it has some rules that it'll use to pick which one it thinks is the best or the most relevant, and so any code that assumes that they're unique is buggy in lean, where whereas that's commonly assumed in Haskell code. Um, Scary. Let's see. Um, well, I mean, you can put a proof in it that says it does the true. right thing. You actually, actually, it's less scary, right? Like because you know, like, if you don't put the proof, then you write bugs, right? So it's like it's cool in a way, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's just a different feature, and it has a different trade off, and you use it differently. Like, like you know, like you can't just port Haskell code line for line to lean. Like, first off, it's strict, but second off, a lot of the parts of the language just work differently, and that's okay, you know. There's more than one programming language in the world. Um, and let's see, it, um, where Haskell has the defaulting rules, Lean has a notion of default instances. So you can essentially make your own default rules by making your own type class instances. This, this worries me, but it's used to, for reasonable things in the standard library so far. Um, They've got some nice work done on making instance resolution be efficient. They've, there's a paper on that that we could add a link to to the description later. You'll email me with a list of all the things I need to find you links to, right? Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, and let's see, what else is there? Um, I mean, what about stuff like yeah. uh, stuff like uh, type fam? Uh, sorry, yeah, uh, type families and uh, multi-parameter type classes. So, like in general, multi-parameter type classes, how are they handled, and the, are there facilities to yeah. say, okay, I have like functional dependency? Sure. That's what I meant. Yeah. yeah. So, so type families are not so relevant when you have full dependent types. Yeah, yeah. So, so sorry, I actually but, I actually but, said uh, the wrong thing. Depths. I meant no, it's fine. It's yeah. Fine. Yeah. Um, so as far as fun depths go there, because we don't have this like uniqueness property talking about actual functional dependencies doesn't make a lot of sense, but there is a notion of something called an output parameter. So, uh, internally like lean, when it sees a type class resolution problem, it won't start searching until the types involved have been solved. Like if they're just bare meta variables, it won't go do it unless those parameters are marked as outputs. And then they're intended to be found by doing instance search. And so. So in that sense, they, they work kind of like a fun depth, but, but there's no sort of global check that there in fact is a functional dependency. In other words, that you can treat the calculation from the inputs to the outputs as a real function, the way you can in Haskell. Yeah, yeah. So it's used for similar things, but it's not actually functional dependencies. That's, that's very interesting. Um, wow, I mean, that, that's a very, that's a thing to think about, right? Yeah. Because when I looked at, so when I looked at the how type classes are resolved, I thought, oh, it's not uh, I who is writing uh, buggy code. It's Lean that has an incomplete sol uh, resolver, for instances. And I have to wait for a little bit, and it's going to be doing global uniqueness checks and stuff like this. Nope. Wow. 
And what would it even mean to be globally unique, right? So, so this when you're writing proofs about programs, then you'd also need to have like a notion of equality of instances, like in order to say whether two instances are the same, right? Because talking about uniqueness is fundamentally talking about sameness, because it says that if there exist two, then they are equal. Um, and well, but once you start talking about instance equality, like that. That's like, an, that's like a global non-modular property of a program. And, and like that's problematic for various reasons. And also you'd want that available as a reasoning principle in your language, right? To say that any two instances of this type class are equal. Because if you can't reason using that, but you are restricted by it, then you're not going to have a good time. And you know, I, I think a nice principle of these languages is that anytime they keep you from doing a thing, they should use the fact that you can't do that thing to make your life easier in some other way. And it's very unclear to me what that principle would actually look like in a language like this. Like, that's like an open research problem of how to do. And one thing that one choice they've made in Lean, and like for example, part of why they don't have co-inductive types, is they want to be very, very conservative with their type theory and not do innovation in the core theory, because they want it to use sort of tested, well-proven results to make the mathematicians feel safe. Nice, nice. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm again, I'm a complete uh, amateur as far as PLT goes. It's interesting for me, but uh, not to a degree where I actually did something meaningful. But uh, yeah, I was thinking like maybe we can even symbolically forbid to define um, another instance. But I think I, I can't. I don't know how to write it. Like I don't know how I would. So it's it's impossible, right? To like symbolically analyze, like um, yeah, symbolically. I don't think analyze. it's impossible. I think I think we don't know how to do it in a way that would make a nice language yet, but I may be wrong, right? Like maybe there's like a paper I just haven't read. Um, I don't know how to do it. Is is something I would I would confidently say. But when you, when you say nice language or nice user experience with type classes, like yeah. in Haskell, we are we are I, at least I mean I I was using Haskell maybe before even some extensions that the, mm -hmm. the work with type classes were a thing. So I got really used to the the following notion. I either own the type or type wrapper yeah. or I own the type class and then I can sure. write an instance. But if sure. none of those are true, then I should be ready to, well, either wrap my type or not write yeah. an instance. So sure. isn't, so do you think it's not nice uh, of a user experience? I, I think that would be perfectly reasonable if we could make it work. I just don't, but, but, but then we, we, we also, but we don't know how to, like, we could probably do that, but I don't know how to then tell but let the user make use of that uniqueness later on logically if they have to write a proof right because if the like so let's say the correctness of your set data type which you've implemented as a as like a balanced tree it relies on any two sets that contain the same type using the same notion of ordering in order to compare elements that you and then you and like you know if you have like two sets that are sorted differently then like your union code is probably going to be busted if it picks the wrong one and like, let's say you want to then prove that your set union implementation is correct. That means you have to know in your proof, in your logic, that there is at most one ordering for a type. And I don't know how to elegantly phrase that in the sort of logical direction here. Right. Yeah, that's, I understand what you're saying. I mean, for me, it's very, um, like... I'm, my argument is only out of laziness, right? I don't do uh, laziness <laughs> as in laziness of a computer yeah. programmer, right? I, don't, I yeah, want yeah. to just be able to prototype and say, well, yeah. this kind of makes sense. Let's leave it like this for a couple of years until my library is actually used by someone. Yeah. And then I will write proofs, right? And then yeah, if I... If I that's if that's I a great thing to do. But, yeah. but any feature we add to a language that has developed proof features should take those proof features into account. Yeah, yeah, that's that's, you know, that's and like Haskell wasn't developed with a bunch of proof features, so it's fine that it that it doesn't have them, you know. But but in a language where that's like most of its reason for existing at all, like Lean, or a language where it's a significant use case like Agda or Idris, or or where it's essentially the whole thing like in Cock, like it really becomes important that you can actually do the thing that the language is there for. So I understand that's that's a uh, fair fair reasoning. Yeah. So. Uh, I mean, I'm just in the order of, of my hardships of, of Haskell. I just have a couple of more more questions. 
deeply nested structures, how are they made, updated? Are there optics in Lean? Is there a starter library maybe, or is there a third library, that, a third party library that's popular? What what's I don't story? know of one. Mm -hmm. You should write one. Okay, and and that'd be a good project. And uh, uh, so and uh, the way we get deep, we drill into the data structures is with projections. Yeah. And they are named or indexed, right? So I can say, yeah, give me field number. Uh huh. Okay. There's one one thing about Lean is that there's a lot of ways to do each thing. <laughs> it's a very sort of flexible notation and, and there's uh that's been one of the challenges actually in writing the book is not overwhelming people in chapter one while still giving them enough so that they can have a reasonable chance of figuring out some code that they run into and understanding the code that the compiler gives them back in error messages so there's a real sort of balancing act on 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 which syntax to describe early and which syntax to wait with and when to introduce and those kind of things but, but yeah so for now it's kind of like writing Haskell code pre-lens. Right. Um, I, I've seen people posting a little bit on the Zulip about lenses, but I haven't seen any sort of widely used library for them. Got it. So, uh, yeah, you and I, while that's it for my questions, uh, but while listening to you, I wrote down some things that I didn't understand. Okay. So if we could do like a very brief, if it's possible, sure. very brief sure. uh, blitz. So, so my... Uh, Brief yeah. question number one is uh, tactics. You said tactics. What's tactics? I don't, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So tactics. Um, when you have one of these languages where you want to write your proof, oftentimes you. So so we talked earlier about proof objects. You know, and and so what that that means is like, um, typically like a type represents a proposition that is like a statement that might be true or might be false, and uh, an inhabitant of that type is evidence that the type that the, that the proposition corresponding to the type is true and that evidence is what we call a proof object and you can build these by hand if you want right so like let's say we have we want to write a you know we want to write a proof then we can say like okay this type like what what are it's what are the constructors of it so i'm going to sit down and, and write them in and, and eventually build it however that's got a lot of downsides one of them is that a big proof object can be incredibly tedious to construct. Like it, it's like oftentimes in real mathematical proofs, you'll have, you know, maybe five or six cases that are all completely obvious and easy and two that are interesting. And, and like you might have very similar, but not identical reasoning in all of those obvious cases. So you'll have, you know, a big bunch of almost copy pasted code. And then, and then you'll, that's like kind of boring. And then you have the other thing and it takes up like, three pages and scrolling through it is unpleasant. Uh, another situation you then run into is, let's say you change the way you phrase your theorem slightly because it turns out that it was a lemma you were proving on the way to some bigger result. And that actually, if your definition were tweaked a little bit, then the bigger result will be easier to prove. Now you have to go change that whole thing again. And so you have a real software maintenance problem. So tactics are a solution to both of these problems. They are metaprograms in the sense that they are programs that write programs where you give the computer a set of high level instructions and then it goes and creates this proof object behind the scene based on those instructions. So, so you might, and, and you can write these instructions to be kind of general. Like you can have, you know, a lot of tactic languages have a notion of failure and recovery. So you can say, try this. If that doesn't work, try this. If that doesn't work, try this. If that doesn't work, try this and so on. And then you can package that up into like a little blob of code that can solve a lot of related programs or a lot of related tasks all at once. And then you can have uh, a proof where you say, um, you know, do my easy, th you know, do my take care of the easy cases tactic. And then anything that that fails to solve, give me back to me and then you do more work. And then let's say you add three more kind of easy cases. You don't have to change your proof at all because the generated code gets updated, but not the code that does the generating. Um, tactics go way back. Uh, actually, the first version of ML, you know, the, the ancestor language to Haskell and standard ML and OCaml, but like ML is short for meta language. And it was the meta language, which is to say the tactic language for Edinburgh LCF, which was Robin Milner's proof system. And so, you know, ML has this nice exception mechanism 
And that goes all the way back toward wanting to recover from failures in tactics. And the, it has this nice way of doing type abstraction because doing type abstraction was used to uh, protect the trusted code of the internals of the proof system from the untrusted user tactic code, which could do ar arbitrary weird stuff. And as long as all the primitives were correct, it was okay. Um, and tactic languages kind of come in two flavors. One of them are languages specifically designed to be tactic languages, like LTAC and COC. The other are the use of the of the language itself within some monad which has tactic or proving related effects. This is the approach taken in Lean 3, Lean 4, and sort of one way to understand the metaprogramming stuff I did for Idris 1 as well. Um, and Agda has a similar design these days now, too. So, like, if you want to write a tactic in Agda, you write it in Agda. If you want to write a tactic in Lean, you write it in Lean. I don't know if they've re-implemented that stuff in Idris 2, but in Idris 1, you would definitely write it in Idris as well. That's cool. Um, and uh, the final question is... Yeah. So, I... It's... I lied. It's not about something you said. It's about something I saw okay. when I was... Uh, playing with lean um I, I noticed almost as if it was a kind i'm not sure i noticed kinds that are indexed with universes but i also noticed something called sort is it kind of yeah. props like what is yeah so so the term kind isn't used in in something like lean there yeah, are leans that usually talk about types and the universes that they inhabit because type arrow type in lean is actually just a type kind of like like the identity function can have type can the, this I say the word type in too many different senses right but but the like if I say like the, you can apply the identity function to nat and get nat back that has type type arrow type um, but um, and, and and this is like a particular thing that you have in lean so in lean you have a universe called prop and the types that inhabit the prop universe are propositions. And they have an interesting property, which is that they are considered proof irrelevant. What that means is that any two proofs of the same proposition are considered equivalent by the lean type checker. So there's no way to write a program that checks which proof of this proposition did I get. And um, Koch has a very similar notion with some slightly different logical principles that govern it. And Agda has got this thing they call S, the, the, like a notion of prop in, in, the, in the very newest versions of Agda, which is also a bit like this, but with some different restrictions on it. So, but you've got this, so you've got this universe called prop. Remember that universe is like a type that describes other types. Then you've got the universe type zero, and that describes ordinary runtime data types. So like natural numbers and those sorts of things that don't contain any types on their own. And you've got type one, which contains type, plus all the other things. And then you've got type two, which contains type one, plus all the other things. And so sort basically is uh, numbered the same way that type is, except sort zero is prop and sort one is type zero. Oh, okay. So it's, it's, it's basically like, uh, you can think of type as being like a the, like oh. the equivalent of like a Haskell type synonym. So right. like and it's, type it's, U equals sort U plus one. And it's kind of relevant due to type erasure, right? Because sometimes we want to mark something that is exactly type U, right? But sometimes we kind of don't care like what... We typically never want to talk about something being precisely type U. We want to use polymorphism to talk about like the set of universes that a type can inhabit. But because prop works so much differently than the other types, we often want to make a thing that only lives in, that only lives in prop, or that is not allowed to live in prop. Yeah, yeah. So when we want to make that distinction, then the prop type dis distinction is convenient. And if we really don't care where it lives, if it can be uh, in prop or in type, then we say sort. Okay, got it, got it, got it. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much, David. It yeah, was no really, really nice to, 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 to talk to you, and it was very insightful. If you have anything to advertise, please, the floor is yours. Sure. I would be remiss if I didn't advertise the Haskell Foundation, which is where I'm the executive director. 
So I want to. I'm gonna. I'm gonna give you a, a little spiel about it. The the Hasco Foundation is an organ is a nonprofit organization, and we're trying to make life better for people who are using Hasco. Um, and that can mean a lot of different things. And if you think you have a good way to make Hasco better, please get in touch with me. If you want to help out with making Hasco better, get in touch with me. We're a very young, very small foundation. Um, you know, it's not like we have a big staff or anything. If you send an email, it'll be me reading it. But, um, you know, like if, if you're, if you're running into sort of challenges with Haskell, if you're running into aspects of using it in your life that you love and, and you want to, and you want to find better ways to share your love, then let me know. You know, if, if you see opportunities for the community that you think we can be useful in, you know, we don't have a gigantic budget, but we do have a budget. Um, and we can hopefully coordinate volunteers and make things better for all of us. Yeah, that's, that's very nice. And, uh, I hope that, uh, uh, Sirocco as well will uh, contribute not just as a shotgun to, to the whole um, ecosystem, but also in, in, in turn as a co-founder of Sirocco, if you need anything uh, particular, you. you can always come to us and we'll see what we can Thanks. do. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I think being, I think being a nonprofit here is really useful because it allows us to think strategically in ways that other organizations can't and allows us to sort of build up uh, an institution over time that can take care of things that are harder to take care of only by volunteers. Like, you know, we'll never probably have the funding to just pay people to do everything and have employees for everything, but at least we can have the role of um, making sure that there are volunteers and raising the alarm if there aren't for certain key topics and, you know, remembering documentation over time and, and these sorts of things. So, yeah, and I think that... You know, it, it's great that we have companies like Syracuse who are making Haskell better, and I hope that we have good. Um, I guess, I guess, I guess now I'm in management. I have to use the word synergy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, absolutely. Like, I think that, as far as I understand, uh, you will be happy, right? If some company like I don't know, Syracuse, Twig, or anyone else would say, "What do you want to be done?" Uh, with yes. us yeah and we will just do absolutely it for this her. already happens today mm -hmm. and, and we're very happy we have you know uh, we have a number of sponsors who support us financially which is what allows us to you know to have me work uh, on the on the foundation full-time and to have our um, you know we, we, we also have a contractor who's working on making the CI better for GHC full-time um, and but also you know people who want to do work on making tooling better and making libraries better, like if we can help coordinate that so that it, so that we cut down a duplication of effort and so people, maybe we can find connections that didn't exist or um, share experiences that people are running into. If, if we can do any of that, then that's, then that's excellent. All right. So it's, it takes okay. all kinds. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for your efforts. Um, Thanks. Thanks for having me on the show.